Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar event, Biocompatibility, Rethinking the New Big Three, Cytotoxicity, Sensitization, and Irritation Testing, brought to you by Nelson Laboratories in collaboration with md and My name is Shana Leonard, Group Editorial Director, Medical Content at UBM Canon, and I'll be your moderator for the webinar today. And today we'll be discussing how the Big Three Biocompatibility Tests, as mentioned, Cytotoxicity, Sensitization, and Irritation, are changing, and what the new era of biocompatibility testing means for medical device manufacturers. Before we begin, however, I do just have a few quick announcements, so please bear with me. This webinar is interactive, so we invite you to check out speaker bios, view additional resources from our sponsor, and share and talk about this webinar via social media. Please also feel free to submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing your question into the Ask a Question area and clicking Submit. You can submit questions as they come to mind, and our speaker will address them during the Q&A session following the presentation as time permits. At the end of the webinar, you'll see a short survey. Please take a moment to fill this out, as your feedback will provide valuable information on the subjects covered in this webinar, as well as how we can improve future webinars. With those brief notes aside, I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker for today's webcast, Thor Rollins. Thor Rollins, Senior Scientist at Nelson Laboratories, is a certified microbiologist and specializes in the selection and conduct of in vitro and in vivo, in vivo biocompatibility tests. He is a participating member on all AMI 1993 and ISO committees and plays an active role in developing standards, discussing biocompatibility methods, and voting on changes to those standards. As one of a select group of experts in the industry, Thor's participation on the committees offers him insight on industry changes and helps him prepare clients for changes in testing. At this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Thor. Thor? Thanks, Shana. And I'm really excited for this webinar today. I'm not saying that the other webinars weren't also uh, a great thing to do, but usually we're talking about um, regulatory issues or, or testing that we uh, have been doing for decades, and, and we're just reinforcing some of the uh, new concepts in those tests. But today we're actually going to be talking about the new big three, which is still cytotox sensitization and irritation, but we're going to be talking about how those three tests, specifically the two tests, the sensitization and irritation, may be changing in the near future. So with that, we're going to be doing a kind of an overview of the, of the three tests, uh, what do those three tests look for, how we kind of look for those endpoints now with the testing, and then kind of talk about something, some tests that are evolving that uh, are gaining some acceptance worldwide that we're trying to implement for medical device testing going forward. So when we're talking about the big three, the first thing we always have to talk about is the difference between a direct contact test and an extraction test. So the big three has these different versions where the test can either, the test sample can either be applied directly to the test system where we take the, the sample that we're intending to test and we'll either apply it to the cells directly or we'll apply it to the skin of the animal directly if we're doing an animal test. And then the other versions of the three tests are an extraction where we take the device and we'll put it into some kind of liquid medium and we'll allow that liquid to extract off chemicals that could either be cytotoxic, sensitizers, or irritants and then we take that liquid, that soup, and we apply it to the test system be it cells or the animal. And so these are the two kind of methods that we, we have for um, medical device testing for these big three. When you're trying to determine what test method works best for a device, really it kind of goes to clinical use or trying to make it the most representative to the clinical situation. So for a direct contact test, the most clinically representative contact would be uh, intact skin. So the most common devices that we use for this type of test method are like gloves and gowns and masks, things along those lines. Really anything else that contacts body fluid, uh, we use the extraction method where we put that device into the fluid. And if, you're th if it's a gray area, if you're a little unsure about which test method to choose, remember the extraction method generally is more sensitive than the direct contact. So we try to lean more toward the, towards the extraction method for most of the devices because it is worst case and it does kind of mimic the, the most uh, representative devices on the market. With the testing that we're going to be talking about going forward, we're going to be talking mostly about extraction versions and that's because the new tests that we'll be discussing are all revolving around, mostly revolving around uh, extracts. 
um, or the complications around those tests revolves around extracts. And then also those are the most common tests performed. So when we're looking at the test methods, the first one being the extraction method, these are the options for the big three for the extraction. So for cytotoxicity, we do the MEM elution test. Um, for the sensitization, we do the magnesium caligmin or the local lymph node assay. And for the irritation, we do the intracutaneous reactivity. So these are the three versions of the extraction test that we do for the big three. For the direct test, for the auger overlay, or for the cytotoxicity, we perform the auger overlay. For the sensitization, we perform the Bueller closed patch method. And then for the irritation, we do a test method called the primary scan. But once again, the, these test methods were we put directly on the animal skin or on the auger or cells themselves. So when we talk about any biocompatibility test, the first thing that we really have to talk about is sample preparation. And this, is in, this holds true for the big three, along with, with you know, any of the tests we're evaluating with extracts. The sample preparation is the most crucial aspect of a biocompatibility test. The test itself is, is pretty much standard testing from lab to lab. No matter what lab you perform on, or use to perform these tests, they'll run the same protocol generally and get very similar results where any variations occur usually occur within the sample preparation. And that's because samples are very different uh, from a, a Band-Aid to a very complex implant and how to prepare them um, really can make a big impact. And to give that an idea, to give you kind of a sense of difference, um, we can look at the surface area versus weight. So in ISO 10993-12, that's the sample preparation standard that gives us insight on how to prepare samples for testing. And we're allowed to use either a surface area to volume ratio for a sample or weight to volume ratio for a sample. And what that means is that when we get a sample in, we have to determine how much volume of this liquid we need to use to extract the sample. We can either weigh that device, and the heavier it is, the more volume we add, or we can perform a surface area of that device, the patient contacting surface area of the device. And then the larger the surface area, contact, uh, surface area of that device is, the more fluid we add to the extract. So those are the two options we have, but even in using those two options, there's huge variability potential. And to kind of give you an example of this, this is a device that is commonly tested. It's a, a partial knee implant, but it could represent any um, implant or medical device that we, we use or test. So in the standard, the weight ratio is 0.2 grams per mil. So for every 0.2 grams of weight or mass the device has, we would add a mil of extract fluid. So for this device, it weighs 93.9 grams. That would represent almost 500 mils of extract fluid being added to this device. If we perform the surface area of this device, the surface area is 115.8 centimeters squared. Using the ratio in the standard for this particular device would be three centimeters squared per mil. So that would give us an extraction volume of almost 40 mils. So when we're comparing this, uh, these, this device using the weight or the surface area, the exact same device by weight would be almost 500 mils, and by a surface area would give us almost 40 mils. So that means there's a 12 times more uh, dilution method going on by weight than surface area. So we'd add almost 12 times more fluid to this device, the same device, by using the weight ratio. And for this reason, the FDA, uh, along with some other regulatory agencies, are starting to prefer uh, surface area as the uh, measuring uh, choice for extracts. So if you perform weight, the FDA is probably going to ask you why you chose weight. And we have to be really thoughtful on our choices when we're doing a sample preparation on what, uh, what choice we choose or else the FDA or any regulatory agency could have a, a big impact. Okay, so some other things that you want to think about when you're doing sample preparation with any biocompatibility test is the surface area. We talked about that. Um, you know, please provide the lab a, a good surface area to perform, uh, for the device. Some of these devices are very complex. And if we perform the surface area here in-house, we break it down to very rudimentary shapes. 
And so it could be a very conservative estimate if the lab performs a surface area. But they, um, most engineers have great software programs that can provide very accurate surface areas that make the test more meaningful, more clinically relevant than how we will provide the surface area. Um, so once we know the volume of extraction we need for these tests, the next thing we have to know is well, how long do we let it sit in that fluid? Uh, so the device is sitting in this, this extract, and we need to know at what temperature and how long we allow it to sit to allow to leach off those chemicals. These extraction times and temperatures are the times and temperatures that are outlined in ISO 10993-12. That first one at 37 degrees for 24 hours, that's only valid for the cytotoxicity. And we'll kind of explain why that is in a minute. But the other four are all used for the other tests. Uh, specifically sensitization and irritation also. So when we're looking at sensitization and irritation, we get to choose 37 degrees or 50 degrees or 70 degrees or 121, um, and those are all Celsius. Uh, uh, we, we tend not to use Fahrenheit very much. Um, so most of the time when we're talking about devices that are in contact with the body, the choice tends to lean towards 37 degrees because that's body temperature, and you know, we, we have clinical relevance in our mind. But we have to also think about the length of time. For a device that is in the body for more than 72 hours, that 37 degrees for 72 hours doesn't really represent the total extract of that device. So if you're, if you're a permanent implant, even if it's in body temperature, it's in contact with the body for much longer than 72 hours. So for that case, we, we recommend exaggerating your temperature up to 50 degrees or 70 degrees you get more of an uh, exaggerated response coming off your device that mimics more of a potential lifetime exposure in the body. The only exception would be is if your device has a glass transition phase that's close to one of those temperatures. For example, if your glass transition phase is 50 degrees, then we might not want to perform a 50 degree extract because we're starting to, to manipulate the, the characteristics of that device. So for that case, we, we want to try to look at something lower, like 37, um, to try not to change too much of the results of that device. So that is one exception, but by rule, most devices do pretty well at 50 degrees C, most materials. And so uh, if you have longer than 72-hour contact, um, we, we recommend you do 50 degrees. And to be completely honest, even if you're less than 72-hour contact with a device, if your materials can hold up to 50 degrees C, we recommend doing 50 degrees C. It's just a, it's easier to justify worst case with the extraction time and temperature. So now that we know how much volume to add, and now we know how long to let it sit in that extract volume, we basically have our test solution. So we have the, the soup that we need to test the device, and we can actually move to the big three tests. And the first one we're going to talk about is the cytotoxicity test. So the cytotoxicity test is a cell test. It's, it's done on L929 cells, which are mouse fibroblast cells. And they're in a hearing cell line, which means they like to attach to things. They like to stick to the wall. And so we use a flask. It's, kind of, um, it's up in the top left corner of the picture. And that flask is kind of our cell farm. So the cells grow in that flask, and they divide. And we give them everything they need to grow and be happy. And then once that flask becomes confluent or is completely covered in cells, we then break those cells apart and we seed those cells onto the, the plates. Um, we use six well plates for the cytotoxicity test generally. We can go smaller. But we put the cells on the bottom of those wells and now the, the cells will start to grow on the bottom of those wells. And so they become confluent on the bottom of the well. And now we have our test system. So we have a, a monolayer or a single layer of cells on the bottom of these plates that we can expose to the test extract. Now, the one unique thing about the cytotoxicity test is that we extract in a specific fluid. That fluid is called minimal essential media, or MEM fluid. Um, and that's where the MEM elution gets its name from. Um, that MEM fluid is just a cell culture media. So it's just a media that provides the cells everything they need to grow um, and, and be happy. And uh, so in the flask there, you see some of that cell culture media. It's a, kind of a, a pinkish reddish color. Um, it has a, a phenol red indicator in it. So if the pH of the extract gets too low, it will turn yellow. If it gets too high, it will start to turn purple. So it can be variant a little bit in color. But that's our extraction um, media. And that's why, if you remember a couple of slides ago, we talked about the 
24 or 37 degrees for 24 hours. That media is why the cytotox is allowed to use that extraction conditions. Um, the media has calf serum in it. It has other proteins that will start to denature if we increase the temperature or have too long of exposure. And that those proteins, when they denature, will make the media not uh, allow cell growth or not propagate cell growth. And so um, obviously we, we want the media to, to help cells respond. So we, we are able to extract it at 37 degrees for 24 hours instead of the higher temperatures and longer times. The other thing I kind of wanted to talk about the MEM fluid a little bit is the ISO 10993-12 standard says that we have to extract both in a polar and nonpolar uh, media. Um, for those of you that don't understand really polar and nonpolar, it's just I, I love salad, so I always go to the vinegar and, and uh, olive oil. Um, so when they don't mix, they separate, uh, just like water and oil don't mix. Um, so the oil is nonpolar, and the vinegar or, or water is polar. And so nonpolar and impolar compounds do not mix. Well, there are some chemical compounds that are lipophilic or lipophobic, which means they'll either come off in oils or they'll come off in waters, and, in water. And just like our body, we have oil and we have adipose or fat tissue that is more nonpolar, and we have um, other portions of our bodies that are more polar. So the devices will see both a polar and nonpolar uh, atmosphere in the body. And so it will pull off chemicals that are polar and nonpolar, um, but our so our extracts have to mimic that. We have to extract in the nonpolar and polar. Now, if you look at the options of extract fluids, I put culture medium both in a nonpolar and polar options. And the reason I did, I did that is because for the cytotoxicity test, we really cannot use a strict nonpolar extract. Uh, the vegetable oil, the PEG, and the DMSO listed there are all cytotoxic by themselves. So if we extract in one of those extraction fluids, it will cause cytotoxicity. And so we are really limited to just using that culture media. Now, the culture media does have 5% uh, bovine serum in it. And so that serum it has some nonpolarity uh, properties to it. But really, it's only 5%. So you don't have a whole lot of nonpolar uh, potential with the MEM extract. Uh, but with the other test, the sensitization and irritation, it's, it's imperative that we use both a polar and nonpolar. Okay, so this is the dashboard for cytotoxicity, give you an idea of uh, turnaround time and cost, or uh, turnaround time of sample size requirements, and some problems we see with the, with the cytotox test, which is latex and silver and coppers and, and things like that. Um, the reason why I wanted to show this is because the benefit of the cytotoxicity test is, one, it's, an, it's the most sensitive test we have. Um, it, it's incredibly sensitive. But two, it's the cheapest and quickest, and that's because it's an in vitro test. Um, it's, you know, we're using cells that we can grow up really fast. We don't have to uh, try to order in animals and get them acclimated, and then we have to wait for the animals. We get a, a quicker response. And one of the downfalls that's always been to the big three is that sensitization test, which that sensitization test is quite long, uh, eight weeks, seven to eight, nine weeks, depending on the lab you use. Um, and even the irritation test is four weeks. And so those two tests are, are very long comparatively. So when you're looking at the big three, uh, you can run them in parallel, but your longest time point is that sensitization test. And the biggest um, issue that we're trying to develop in these tests is we're trying to look at an alternative for that sensitization and irritation test that can still be as predictive as the animal test or more predictive than the animal test, but use an in vitro option. And that's kind of a, a hint of where we're going in a, in a little bit. So first, with the cytotoxicity, we take that extract from the MEM fluid and we expose it to our cells that are on the six well plates. And then we have to score them. So what we do is we, we visually look at the cells and we look at their health. And we score their health on a zero to four scale, where zero is you know, no cytotoxicity and four is severe cytotoxicity. Um, this is an actual uh, chart uh, out of the ISO 10993 and the USP Section 87, and it gives you a percentage of toxicity. So a zero is well, zero, no percentage. Uh, a one is some, but less than 20%. Um, a two score is between 20 and 50% of the cells have some kind of toxic effect. A three is between 50 and 70%, and anything over 70% is a four. 
So we, we evaluate the toxicity of the cells and look at the percentage of that toxicity compared to the negative control and give it a score, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Um, this is also, the, uh, as far as acceptance criteria goes, a 0, 1, and 2 is considered passing, a 3 and 4 is considered failing. So you can actually have up to 50% of the cells be affected in some ways and still have a passing uh, result. And that just kind of shows you how sensitive this cytotoxicity test is. So this is our cells. Um, we, uh, this is our negative control. This is our L929 cells. And so kind of the things we look for is we want to see this great pattern on the bottom of the well, this, uh, this mosaic-looking pattern where the cells are stretching out, making connections, uh, forming these, these, these great formations. Um, this means the cells are healthy and they're growing. Uh, we also see a little bit of red in the cells. That's a stain called neutral red. It's a viable stain, which means healthy cells will bring it into their lysosomes. So we want to see that stain present. And so this, this is a great uh, picture of healthy cell line, and this would be a zero for us. In comparison, this is our positive control, which is latex. Latex is a fixative, which means it fixes the cells to the bottom of the plate. And um, as you can see in this slide, there are a lot of empty spaces where there is no cell growth whatsoever. And there are formations that look like cells, but because latex is a fixative, um, that's actually the skeleton of the cell left behind. So it's kind of gruesome. You have just an empty field of, of cell skeletons down there. Um, and so we really have almost complete destruction. There are a couple cells there that may still be technically alive, but definitely are not healthy. Um, and one way we know this is because we stain the same slide with that neutral red stain, and as you can see, um, only a couple of them even have any red in them whatsoever. So um, this is the cytotox uh, test. We, we expose the cells to your extract, and we uh, visually uh, assume the, uh, how toxic the cells responded to your um, sample. And then based off that percentage, we give you the score of pass and fail. Like I said, very cheap, very quick, uh, and very sensitive. So it's a very good screening test. Now, for the next two tests, we're going to be talking about the irritation and sensitization of the big three. I'm going to give you what is traditionally done right now as one of the tests that we look for for irritation, kind of tell you what irritation is and sensitization is. Um, but then I'm going to explain a little bit about what we're seeing coming as a potential for in vitro options. So we'll talk about the in vitro irritation and the in vitro sensitization, and we'll kind of talk about how they're progressing in possible replacements for the animal tests. So first, we talk about the traditional irritation, which is the intracutaneous reactivity, which is done in rabbits. Um, we extract your device in a polar and nonpolar. Uh, for this test, we use vegetable oil and saline for extracts. And then we inject um, intracutaneously those extracts into the rabbits. And uh, what we're looking for is a redness and swelling, which uh, most people know from irritation, um, uh, chemicals, detergents. Um, in fact, detergents are the most likely cause in our experience for uh, detergents and other chemical residuals on a device are the most likely cause or source of an irritation for a medical device. Uh, what we've seen at Nelson Labs is most materials that are used in medical devices are safe. I mean, they, <laughs> we see the, the repeat of materials coming in day to day, and they get tested over and over again. And to some people, that's a little bit irritating because they, they want to know why we have to retest the same materials over and over again. And the reason why is it's not because it's the materials necessarily, even though that's important in the test. It's residuals from the process. And everybody has a different process for making those materials. And so we have to uh, screen residuals as a potential impact to safety. And the detergents and, and chemicals are all potential irritants, uh, depending on the, the amount and type. So for the intercutaneous irritation, the animal test, this is done in three rabbits. So um, we inject, like I said, intercutaneously into the rabbit. We do five sites on the right side of the rabbit and five sites on the left. The benefit of the irritation test is that it's a localized reaction, so it's not systemic. So we can do multiple doses in one animal and, and get a good response. And then we look at the um, reactions that happen at the localized injection spots at 24, 48, and 72 hours. And what we're looking for is redness and swelling, uh, what everyone kind of knows as, as an irritant. Um, 
then after the 72 hour mark, we then um, take the scores and we divide them by 15. So we have the three time points. Uh, we times those by five injection sites. So that's how we get the 15. Um, and so we add up all the scores and divide by 15. And then we take the scores from each of the rabbits and divide those by three to get an average of all. So we have the average per rabbit and the average um, of the three rabbits together. And that gives us kind of an irritation score. And if your test rabbit has a score of one or greater compared to your control rabbit, then you have a potential irritant on your hands and you uh, need to uh, assess uh, the potential there. So. This is the intracutaneous irritation. There are some other animal irritation tests that we perform uh, based on the uh, route administration of the device, but the intracutaneous is the, the most common uh, test that we perform. And this is the test that's been used for irritation for the past 20, 30 years to be able to justify medical devices as being safe. Recently, there's been some great movement on the in vitro irritation. And to give you a little bit of background on the in vitro irritation, um, ECVAM, uh, European Central for Alternatives to vet, uh, Animal Use, over in Europe, has validated the in vitro irritation for cosmetics. And they did a, a wonderful validation uh, to show how this test method works. What we're trying to do now is we're trying to incorporate their validation into medical devices. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on the in vitro irritation and, and the efforts that we're doing to now uh, use it on medical devices going forward instead of the animal test. So the, the main part of the in vitro irritation has to do with these reconstructed human epidermises. So as you can see in the pictures, we have, we, we're going to call them RHEs going forward. These RHEs are actually just little fake skins. Or I shouldn't say fake. They're actually derived from humans, so they're, they're a representation of reconstructed skins. And so they have the same concepts of structure of a, an in vitro skin, or an in vivo skin, excuse me, that we can now test on to see the, the response that we likely see in an animal, we can now see on these, on these skins. And so um, it, this is the kind of test platform we use. We're still doing a topical exposure, um, but this topical exposure is on these, these um, reconstructed human epidermises. So the, as I mentioned, the chemicals, as the current uh, procedure is, is done on chemicals, and it's already been validated on the chemicals and shown a great um, correlation with the animal test. And so what we're trying to do is now manipulate it slightly that we'll be able to use extracts as our test system and not just chemicals. Um, and so what we're doing is a round robin test going forward with a lot of labs in the ISO 1093 committee to try to get some data together to show robustness in this, in this structure that we'll be able to take the samples, extract them very similar to how we extract all the other tests, and be able to show a response in these RHEs. So, um, to kind of give you a walkthrough of how we do this, the test is a topical exposure of the test article, uh, so the extract in the medical device case. Um, if the test device is a powder or a chemical or a drug, then we can apply it directly to the test um, system. And in the upper right corner, you see that picture. That's actually the, the epidermis. Uh, so it's a very small um, tissue, uh, but uh, that's what our, our test is. So. Um, and then we measure cell viability, and we do that using dehydrogenase. But most, basically, it's a conversion. It's the MTT test, which I think some people are familiar with. If you're not, the MTT test uses uh, this com compound, and when it metabolizes, it forms a salt, a, a blue color. And that blue color allows us to see the viability of the cells. So the more blue there, the more healthy the cells are. And we can actually perform a quantitative uh, spectrophotometer reading on the blue um, to be able to determine how, how many of the cells were viable. So the more stain there, the more viable stains there were. And we can uh, we compare that to um, a control, a positive control, a negative control, to, to help us look at the percentage of viability compared to the controls. Now, this MTT test can give, on this tissue gives us an indication of of irritation based on the viability. So the more uh, the, the more viable cells in this um, cell membrane, the less irritation that's ha that's happened, and the um, the less viability of the cells, the more irritation has happened. So um, 
with the sample preparation part, like I said, this is the biggest uh, obstacle that we have going forward, in my opinion, when we're looking at medical device um, adaptation to the irritation, the in vitro irritation protocol. And that's because the validation happened with chemicals, and it's easy to get a positive control chemical that's an irritant. With a medical device, we, we are extracting that, and we have to prove that the extraction can pull off irritants in, in enough ma sufficient amounts to be able to cause an irritation response. And that's what we're um, performing. And in fact, uh, at Nelson Labs, we've actually uh, done a lot of validations internally, and we have a group of materials that we've been able to get responses from, uh, positive responses from in both the uh, polar and the nonpolar extract. So uh, we're able to put these materials in with a, a validation and uh, going forward and hoping to get enough data to, pr to present to other regulatory agencies to help accept this method going forward. I mentioned that with liquids um, and powders, uh, we can grind them and put them directly onto the tissue uh, to be able to see the kind of response also. So um, we get the tissues um, in, and we order them from suppliers, and they come in on 24 well plates. And then we remove them from the agarose that they come in on. We make sure that they're good tissues, that there's no issues with them. And then um, they're dried, and then they're placed directly into media that we have, fresh media, ready for them to go and incubate them overnight so that they're prepared to test on. And then after the preconditioning of those tissues, um, then we expose them to the extracts. And with an extract right now, we add, uh, Nelson Labs is adding 100 microliters to um, each surface of the skins in triplicate. Um, and then they are exposed for 24 hours, uh, plus or minus two, to that extract. Um, with chemicals, there are some other uh, ways to do that. I list them on the side. So this really is uh, an option going forward for most medical devices uh, and pharmaceuticals. So as soon as the exposure time is over, we rinse the tissues, um, and uh, there's a lot of rinsing that we do, um, and then we blot them dry, and then, um, and then we carefully dry the swab with a sterile swab, um, and then we move it on to perform that MTT test, which I mentioned before, and that looks at the viability of the cells underneath. Um, and this is a, uh, an example of the MTT, and so you just get to see that blue or almost looks purple uh, stain. The more stain present, remember, the more viable the cells were, so the less irritation. So you want to see that purple. You want to see more purple there than the clear. Um, and so we, we take the, uh, the, we release the stain from the tissue using IPA, and then we put that in these uh, wells and the 96 well plates, and then we use the um, reader uh, to be able to look at how much uh, color is present in each well. And that will give us a, an idea of the viability and also of the irritation. So this is the kind of the results that we get. So we get uh, a percent viability based off the, the reads that we perform. And as you can see in that chart, the positive control has a very small, low amount of viability, which means that we had a lot of, of uh, irritation happening at the cells, uh, where the other samples that we're showing have a very um, high viability. Now, what we're trying to find as far as acceptance criteria is 50%. So if you're under 50%, then um, you're considered an ir a possible irritant. Um, there are some other tests that we can perform at that point. We can look at for interleukins that are signals for um, irritants. In fact, at Nelson Labs, we perform that on all the tests because we want to make sure there's not a device that is still viable but has, has um, issued interleukins in the cells. So interleukins is just a, a, a way that for us to kind of have an additional screen for potential irritants. Um, so that test is performed here at Nelson Labs on every single device, fell or not. Uh, we, we add that test to the test procedure. So that's the in vitro irritation. Um, the in vitro irritation, just so you know, I have seen used successfully in Europe for medical devices um, right now. So we have that test validated here at Nelson Laboratories. Um, if you are going to Europe or um, uh, some other regulatory uh, arenas, uh, the in vitro irritation is accepted um, in, that, in those areas. The FDA at this point has not, in our experience, has not been accepting the in vitro irritation, although we have been in discussions with the FDA on our test protocol and getting feedback from them, uh, along with the um, round robin that we're looking at taking place going forward, 
that we're hoping to provide them with enough detail comparing the in vitro irritation to the animal irritation to show them that it's even more sensitive, which we believe is even more sensitive than the animal test. So the thought would be going forward, if we can prove this to the regulatory agencies, that the in vitro method would be used as a screening method for the irritation. If you do see some irritation in the in vitro test, either with the interleukin test or the NTT test, then that would trigger you to go into an animal uh, verification of that failure. Um, we, even though we believe that the in vitro irritation is more sensitive based on studies that we have done, there's not been enough data to overwhelmingly call the in vitro irritation more sensitive, and that's what we're hoping to gather, that we'll be able to present a, uh, a good case to all regulatory agencies across the world that this alternative is a viable alternative. Um, the turnaround time and cost for this test could be uh, much less. Uh, right now the cost is close to being equivalent to the animal test based on the cost of the tissues, but it's a relatively new test and the tissues are not supplied in the demand that we uh, were thinking that would, be need, would need to be done. And so the cost and turnaround time would both go down um, once we get this more regulated and more, uh, occurs more often. Excuse me, going back. So the um, next test we're going to talk about is the sensitization. And, and so I, I put up here some options for the sensitization. Like I've talked about uh, the local lymph node assay and the Bueller method is the direct version. We're going to be talking about the guinea pig max a little bit. It's the one version we're going to be talking about. Now, the guinea pig maximization is just like the, the intercutaneous reactivity. It's been used for a very long time in the industry to help predict sensitization. Um, that test is, does not elicit a response very often. So there's not a failure in that test very often, very often for medical devices. And that's just because most products that we use making medical devices are not sensitizers just because we don't want to put those in our devices. So this test is, it does not fail very often, but we run it with almost every single medical device. And like I mentioned before, the turnaround time is eight to nine weeks and it's the most expensive out of the big three by a large margin. And for this reason, this has always been the biggest headache for the big three. Um, and this is where we're going to see the most benefits from an in vitro alternative. To kind of get you an idea of sensitization, um, and the best way to explain sensitization uh, is poison ivy. So the poison ivy is a, is a very well-known sensitizer, and the first time you contact poison ivy, um, you may not break out. Um, but your body sends these cells that will remember that toxin, and the next time you contact poison ivy or the third time you contact it, then you'll actually break out into that traditional, in fact, um, I have it right here, a picture of the poison ivy reaction that people um, are familiar with. So that's a true sensitizer, and um, that's the kind of uh, result that we um, hopefully are not seeing in our test. But because of that um, repeat exposure that the sensitization needs to elicit a response, that's why this test is so long. So if you look at the three phases that we run, we do an induction phase one, an induction phase two, and then a challenge phase. And what that means is we actually extract a device in polar and nonpolar at three different time points. So we extract a device in polar and nonpolar, we do a, a, an injection into the guinea pig, and then we let those biological reactions happen. And then we extract a brand new device in polar and nonpolar. Um, we inject in the same spot in the guinea pig, and once again, just allow any biological reactions to happen. Then we have a challenge phase where we wet a patch that's been soaked in the extraction fluid, and we put that patch over the injection site. And then at 24, 48, and 72 hours, we look for that redness and swelling. Because we have to wait for the animal to respond for the biological reaction to occur, that's why this test takes so long, is because we have to wait for that guinea pig uh, to get a true sensitization response. Um, and then we, we scored on redness and swelling, very similar to um, the irritation test. Um, so to give you an idea of scoring, this is you can use different scoring methods, um, but the, the concepts are all the same. So this is just an option. Most people, uses, most people use a 0 to 4 scale. This is a 0 to 3 scale, um, where 0 is no redness and swelling whatsoever. Um, a 1 is some redness and some swelling, but not both. Um, a 2 is, is uh, both redness and swelling, and then 3 is uh, severe swelling. So that's kind of the animal test. Now, um, and then... 
if you, you compare that to negative controls, if it's a greater than a one, then you consider it a potential sensitizer. Now, the in vitro sensitization is not as well defined in the industry as the in vitro irritation. So the in vitro sensitization um, right now is going through the validation in Europe. Um, the, the issue that we have with sensitization is there's, some, there's multiple biomarkers that we need to look at to be able to um, assess sensitization. Uh, so we have some protein binding that we, we assess. There's also some gene expression that we assess. And so I'm going to kind of go through each of those in a little bit of detail right now. So the first thing that we look for is uh, a glutathione uh, reduction assay, which uh, glutathione is a uh, uh, tripeptide oxidant, and it's found in living cells. And it's just a good marker for to measure the ability that the um, the substance has to bind the proteins in that in the cells. So what we do is we extract a medical device, just like normal in any biocompatibility test that is incubated, um, and then we incubate that extract with the solution of the glutathione. So this glutathione now will um, uh, bind with any sensitizers in that extract. Then we add the Elmens reagent, and what the Elmens reagent is, it's a, it's just a, a colors compound, but when it interacts with free um, glutathione, it will turn yellow. So if the sensitizer is present, it will bind with the glutathione. But if it's not present, then we'll have all this glutathione um, in the solution being free, unbound. But then those unfree or those free and unbound glutathionones will then bind with this Elmens reagent and turn yellow. So now if we have yellow, we know that um, the, the is for, so if we, if we have less yellow, we know it's a sensitization has occurred because that those sensitizers have prevented the reaction from occurring. So we want to see yellow in that test. Um, to give you kind of a reaction, this is the uh, glutathione reaction that we see. So once again, um, it either binds with sensitizers or will bind with the um, color agent. Um, and once it binds, it turns yellow, so we want to see that yellow. So that's the first biomarker that we perform on the in vitro sensitization. Um, the next one that we use is um, it's an ARE gene expression. And ARE means it's an antioxidant response element. Um, it's just this element, this ARE gene, is turned on in a presence of a sensitizer. So we're using PCRs to, or a PCR machine to look for the presence of or this activated uh, or turned on ARE gene. Uh, gene. And so this is done in the same um, tissues that we use for the irritation. So we use the, the same tissues that we get for the irritation, we expose it to the extracts, and then we um, pretty much dissolve those tissues and put them in our PCR machine looking for these RA, uh, ARE genes. Um, and then so the sensitizers will cause an increased expression in the RE genes, so we'll be able to pick those up compared to the negative control. So we're using this kind of um, response curve when we're looking at with our um, um, PCR to be able to determine if there's been an increased response in those genes. If there has been an increased response in the genes, then we know that in vitro, that sensitization has occurred or potentially has occurred. The last one that we use um, to, for in vitro sensitization, we either use the LDH cytotoxicity assay or we go back to use our MTT one we use for in vitro irritation. So we're kind of looking at the same endpoints as the irritation test because if an irritation has happened, um, then um, sensitization response has occurred. Now, the LDH is a better test for the um, sensitization. But we have noticed that the LDS interacts, it has a, a bad interaction with our positive control that we're using. So for that case, LDH doesn't always work with our controls. So we have started using more of the MTT assay to help predict sensitization. Now the question I, I always get when I try to explain the sensitization is I've given kind of three different tests and, and how do we use those two tests to predict, or three tests to predict sensitization? And actually that's where the biggest controversy right now in the industry is occurring. So we have these three biomarkers, and um, some labs and some places have, have developed algorithms that take each one of these um, endpoints and put it into the algorithm to help predict sensitization. The validation that's going on in Europe right now is looking at these endpoints, these biomarkers, and trying to validate against the animal test to determine which impact, uh, which, which uh, procedure would be the best representation or what uh, 
ver uh, combination of procedures. So right now, what we're kind of looking at is if you take the medical device and you perform that extraction, then you can expose it to the cells. Um, the same cells, like I talked about, that we use for the, the same tissues uh, that we use for the um, in vitro irritation. Then we can take those tissues, we can do our RNA on those, and we can also take the extract and, and perform the um, reduction assay to look for that yellow uh, agent. So we can use um, the same extract to look for multiple endpoints. Um, we can also use those tissues to look for at the NCT or LDH cytotoxicity assay. So in theory, even though we have these three biomarkers, we could take the same device and perform the same extract and use the same extract for all three biomarkers. So our assumption is that the three biomarkers will all kind of take a key role in predicting sensitization. But this in vitro sensitization is much more, um, it's not as developed as the in vitro irritation. So the in vitro irritation is much closer to being a, a, a valuable option for all regulatory agencies to replace the animal test. The sensitization is a little bit more work that has to go into and some discussion between labs and scientists to be able to determine which approach is the best and best mimicking or best, best to represent sensitization going forward. So in a summation of the in vitro irritation and sensitization. The in vitro irritation can be used right now in Europe for medical devices. We're very close to be able to prove, in my opinion, um, a, a good uh, correlation between the animal test and the in vitro test. The sensitization is a little farther out, but it has the biggest benefit. Because of that turnaround time, we could reduce that drastically if we could get an in vitro model. So we are working on that very hard um, to be able to get to an uh, endpoint that we feel like represents best the animal model. So I put in here some references uh, for you to look at uh, from uh, the um, discussion. And uh, now I know we have about, I think, 12 minutes left to go to Q&A. So um, we, I think we can go to this point. Thanks, Thor. That was a really informative presentation. Um, as you said, I think now we'll move into the Q&A portion of our event. If you have a question, please uh, feel free to submit it now using the Ask a Question box in the lower right corner of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as time permits. As Thor mentioned, we do have about 12 minutes left, and we have received a flood of questions over the course of the uh, presentation, which looks fantastic. Uh, for those that we aren't able to get to during the live presentation, uh, Thor and the Nelson Labs team will follow up after the event with attendees whose questions we weren't able to get to. So um, hopefully if we can't get to your question during the live event, then we will be able to get you an answer regardless. So uh, looking at our questions, the first one came in, I think it re refers to uh, an earlier part of your presentation towards the beginning, Thor. For surface area, is it surface area in contact with patient skin and fluid, or total device surface area for all components in the device? Great co a question. And, and how the ISO 10993 is written is we're only concerned about the patient contacting portions. That's directly or indirectly. Um, and the reason why that is is, remember, we're doing off surface area. So let's take a device that has a, uh, the patient contacting portions, the distal end. And let's say that distal end is very, very small. Well. That's the portion we're concerned about because that's the portion that goes into the patient. But if we, if we include all the shaft and all the handle that the, the user, the clinician is touching, then we will be diluting out the distal end um, of that device, what really is impacting the customer. So it could be toxic, but if we include all this other safe material, then we wouldn't know that. If you do want to test clinician contacting portions or other portions of the device, um, you know, we're, we're never going to turn down testing, but uh, just be careful on what tests you do, and uh, make sure it's separate from the, the patient contacting portions. Great. Thanks, Thor. Uh, moving on to our next question. What if you cannot submerge the device in the extraction media due to a very large surface area of every component in the device? Another great question. Um, we tend to try to use uh, coupons or representative portions of that device. Um, the FDA just released last year in April um, their new guidance document, and it gives instructions or considerations when looking at coupons. But basically what a coupon is, is it's, it, it represents the materials, the processing of your device in the same proportions, but it's just small or um, in a different shape. Um, and so what we're looking for material in these extraction tests, what we're looking for is uh, material and processing residuals. So you just represent those. Um, other things are we don't need a functional device, so we don't need all the internal components or even um, you know, portions that 
uh, could represent the whole. So each device might be a little uh, – some devices are more difficult than others, but uh, you just work with your lab to come up with an alternative, and we've never seen a device that we haven't been able to come up with an alternative for. Great. Thanks for that. Um, moving on to our next question, 10, and, oh, sorry, 10993-5 now says quantitative method is preferred. Should we use an assay such as the MTT cytotest? Uh, that's, that's a great question, too. So you're right, the, the quantitative method is preferred, but there's been some um, uh, issues <laughs> with the MTT test. Uh, there's been discussion where we've actually seen the MTT test be more sensitive than the MEM test. And the MEM test is already, in some people's opinion, too sensitive for medical devices uh, for some compounds. So we're making the most sensitive test more sensitive by using the MTT. Um, you, you do want to use a quantitative method in whenever you can. Uh, regulatory agencies right now are accepting the MEM elution test. And in my opinion, it, since the cytotox really is a screening test and it is already sensitive, I don't like using the NTT test on all devices because you're increasing that sensitivity. Um, like I mentioned before, we have not seen um, a regulatory agency uh, not take the MEM, but there is always that risk because the ISO does recommend a quantitative method. Great, thanks for that. Um, moving on to our next question, let's see. Um, it's a, it looks like it is a follow-up question to that one related. 10993-5 has recommended quantitative method instead of grades. Have you uh, conducted comparison studies, which is more sensitive? Yeah, and like I mentioned, we haven't internally done, but uh, I know at the ISO we've had a lot of discussions um, uh, and there's been some work done um, on the difference in sensitivity, uh, and the MTT has shown to be more sensitive. Um, there, the studies that were shown, if you do a recovery phase on those cells, it tends to get it a little bit um, more uh, to the sensitivity level of a cytotox test, but um, there's still some questions about uh, you, how sensitive that test is compared to the MEM and the benefits of using it. Great, thank you. Uh, moving right along, we'll try and fit in just a few more questions before we run out of time. In the, uh, sorry, in the in vitro irritation test, it's specified that the culture system is epidermis. So would this be able to potentially replace intracutaneous injection, or is it the in vitro method just going to be able to replace topical skin tests? Great question. We are looking at validating it against intracutaneous and adding other um, endpoints also. Um, you know, right now the big push is to compare it against the intracutaneous because that is the most common uh, method. Um, but we know that other people use ocular irritation, mucosal irritation, vaginal irritation, and we want to kind of get an idea how it represents with those two. We, we really, we really want to make it a screening test um, where if you do fail, so we want to prove that it's more sensitive than all those methods, and then if you do fail the in vitro, then that goes on to the, then it pushes you to the irritation that represents the body contact as a confirmation test. So that's the hope. Um, right now, we're, we're just focused on the intracutaneous because that is the most common method. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Sor. Uh, our next question is, in approving a medical device, should all three, cytotoxicity, sensitization, and irritation tests, be conducted, or is one sufficient? What are the conditions? That, that's another a common question we get. So if you look at ISO 10993 and the FDA's draft document, all three tests are either required to perform or justify why they are not uh, performed. So what that means, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to run them all, um, but it, what it means is you have to evaluate all endpoints. And so um, if you have something, that, for example, like a stainless steel, an ASTM grade stainless steel, and you have very little processing to it, you may be able to justify out of a test based off of historical data, um, use of the device, things like that. So there, are, And all that justification is in the new draft document that they have to release last year. Um, but you still have to address those endpoints. So yes, you have to either perform them or address why you did not. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, is there an approach about how to do in vitro irritation with ocular tissue as an ocular irritation? As of now, our tissue that we have been, has been validated and used is that uh, epidermis tissue. That being said, I, like I mentioned before, we are trying to, um, going forward, we would try to show comparison against all types of irritation to, hope, to help use it as a screening tissue, just screening test, just not for intracutaneous, but also for ocular or, or 
or mucosal or whatever other irritation test. Okay, great. I think we have about time for three more questions that we'll finish up. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, any we didn't get to, as there are quite a few that we won't have time to get to during the live event, uh, Nelson and Thor will reach out directly after the presentation within the next uh, day or two in order to get you your responses. So moving on to our next question, have you started performing in vitro tests for any medical device companies yet, or is it just in a proposed level? No, we perform the in vitro irritation for uh, devices that go to Europe. Uh, we've been doing that routinely. We have it validated, uh, submitting to the Europe uh, European Union um, quite frequently. The in vitro sensitization is a little harder. Uh, we, we do look at the endpoints. We have submitted um, you know, data to the regulatory agencies on that, but there, it's not as defined as the irritation. Um, like I mentioned in my presentation, the FDA right now still is looking for more information, more data before it starts leading towards that, but Europe has been accepting it, yes. Great, thanks for that. Um, what TAT is perce uh, perceivable for the in vitro test? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Uh, what TAT is oh, perceivable turnaround time? for the yeah, um, so right now, the turnaround time for this test is about three weeks, um, two week to three to, two to three weeks. Um, the hard part is the tissue itself. So the tissues, um, we have to use them right away, so we can't store them. And so once we have an order come in, um, we, we, so if, if your device gets sent in for testing and it's in between orders, then it might take a week before we can get started. Um, and uh, so two to three weeks right now, we're looking for the, the turnaround time. Once we get approved, once this test starts getting accepted more, then obviously we'll be able to maintain a stock, a rotation, uh, a higher rotation, and be able to cut that turnaround time down even, even more. Okay, great. Um, due to time constraints, I do think this will probably be our last question, but we just had tons of really great questions that we, that we weren't able to get to, and again, um, we will get to them after the fact. So our last question is, for irritation testing, if regulatory submissions are planned for Europe and the U.S., do you recommend performing both the new in vitro test and the standard intracut intracutaneous reactivity? So the uh, approach that we have had companies do is it kind of depends on your timelines for both these tests. If you're looking at getting in Europe quicker um, than the than, uh, USA FDA, then uh, we've had people perform both. And that way they can submit to Europe with the response and then wait for the animal test to come back for the FDA. That also helps, <laughs> and I, I don't want to make it sound uh, kind of um, – uh, selfish, but it helps us with our data because then we can uh, have more data to be able to show the FDA a comparison between the animal uh, test and the in vitro test. So we we love that. Um, we, we know it's an additional cost uh, to the company, so we don't we don't ask for that unless it's a benefit to you to get into Europe quicker. Okay, fantastic. So uh, I think that at this point we're going to have to wrap it up due to again time constraints. Um, that's unfortunately all the time we do have for questions, but I would like to thank Thor Rollins and our sponsor, Nelson Laboratories. I'd also like to thank our attendees. We appreciate your attention and participation, as well as all of those really great questions that you guys submitted. And we look forward to your attendance at future events. This presentation will be available shortly in an on-demand format. As a registered user, you will receive an email with detailed information on how you can access the on-demand replay of this webinar. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to the event. This webinar is copyright 2014 by MDNDI. The presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Nelson Laboratories. The individual speaker is solely responsible for his content and opinions. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.